Hi everyone, my name is Stella and today I will be doing an introduction to Java mini lecture. I won't waste your time, so let's jump right in. Starting out with some Java syntax. No matter what other language you came from, Java does have some specific syntax quirks that we are going to get into. Starting off, we use curly braces to mark code sections in Java and we use semicolons to mark ends of lines. In Java, you can also use the double backslash for a single line comment or the double backslash with stars in between for multiple line comments. Less on the syntax now and more about the Java development environment and what an IDE is. So an IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment and it's basically a really handy tool that helps programmers like you write, test, and debug your code more easily. And so you can think about it as um, an artist who has a paper and a pencil, um, but an IDE would provide the artist a variety of brush sizes, colors, an undo button, or another feature that could tell the artist where they have not painted yet. So in CS6UNB, we use an IDE called IntelliJ. And IntelliJ has some really useful features that I'll point out now. Um, it has error detection, denoted here by this little squiggly line with red, and it can detect errors and provide potential fixes for you to fix up those errors. It also has code highlighting where different words in code are highlighted in different colors for ease of use and readability. It also has a left-hand side console with a breakdown of your files and folders so you can easily navigate your code. Now going into Java types. So Java has eight primitive types and everything else is a reference type. So for thinking about primitive types, you can imagine a small lunchbox that holds a singular item. And let's say we have a primitive type int and we're storing it in this small lunchbox. We could have the number five in the lunchbox. We could have the number three or the number one in our little lunchbox. We could have the same thing for a Boolean primitive type, a Boolean lunchbox that could hold true or false. On the other hand, we have reference types, which go in big lunchboxes. Now we can hold more than one item. For example, strings are a list of words. So in our big lunchbox, now we can hold the whole string, hello, my name is Stella. So now being able to hold more objects um, in a reference type, Let's go into one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Reference types in this big lunchbox are actually pointers to that object in memory. So for our string reference type or lunchbox, we would actually have a pointer inside pointing to where that string belongs. Same thing with arrays. It's actually a pointer, not the array itself. On the other hand, for primitive types, we have it inside our small lunchbox. If we open that lunchbox, we have the actual variable itself in there. Going more into Java basics, we have if else statements. This is what a simple if else statement looks like in Java. We also have for loops. For loops look a little different in Java than other programming languages. They start with a base condition, followed by the stop condition, and lastly, what we're incrementing by. So in this first example, we start at zero, we end when i is less than 10, and we're incrementing by two each time. Java also has for each loops, for collections or arrays. Here is an example of a for each loop with an array. And this is pretty key to Java, is that variables have types, and they are typed when they are declared. So if we create a new variable to represent string or five or um, 1.5, then we really need to be declaring the type of the variable before use. So here you can see that we have the type of the variable before the variable name when we declare it. Next, functions actually have return types and void represents having a no return. Here are two examples of Java functions. The first function is void and that means it does not return anything. And you can see that because there is no return keyword in the body of the function. The second function, however, 
is an int return type. And that means it's going to return an integer, and in fact it does. It returns 7. Additionally, in Java, all code lives within a class. But what really is a class? It's actually like a blueprint or recipe that tells us how to create objects, and it can contain variables and functions for how things operate. And classes are really useful for organizing code and also abstracting away complexity if we're using some code multiple times. Here's an example of a class in Java. This is a student class. We declare this class with public class student. This public word here we'll use for now, but it could also be changed. It's called an access modifier. And public means it can be accessed anywhere, but there's also private. And we'll get into that in another lecture. The main method in Java is where all code is executed. So building off of our student class from the last slide, we now have a main method inside. This is a line you'll see a lot, and it's a line you'll be copying from class to class. Basically, what the main method serves as a purpose is when our code is run, and this is how we run code in IntelliJ, we look for that main method like page one of a book. And we execute whatever is in the body of that method. Java also has variables inside classes, and these variables can be properties of that class. So for a student class, we have a variable that's an integer that is an ID number. Classes also have functions, which are actions for the class. And here's one function. Um, avoid method to say hello. So it will print hello. Classes in Java also have constructors, and this is key because constructors construct or create instances of the class. So here we have a constructor for the student class, and we can tell it's a constructor because the name of the class will match the name of the constructor. And so this is really important to find the constructor in the code and also create your own constructors and classes. Now inside the body of our constructor, we need to set the ID number to the ID number of a specific student. So the way we do this is use the this keyword to reference the current object or instance of the class and then set that to the one we're passing in. So say we're creating a new student, we're setting this student's ID number to the ID number we're passing in. Let's talk about creating objects. Now you can see our class is all coming together. We have variables, a constructor, and a main method. And in this main method, we have an object creation. We declare a variable in this class with the type student. We use the new keyword to create a new instance of this class. And we pass in the attributes for the object based on the constructor. So the constructor told us, if we're creating a new student, we need an ID number. So in this case, our student Stella, this new student, we are using her ID number, which is 12345. So now we are going into static versus instance. Static variables and functions belong to the entire class. And so here's an example of a static variable for our student class. And this variable is university, and it's a string that represents the university the students go to. And so this is static because the university does not change across students. All the students are going to the same university, and that's UC Berkeley. And we denote this using the static keyword when we declare the variable or method. Instance variables just belong to each individual object. And so ID number is a great example of an instance variable because each student has its own unique ID number. So let's talk about an example now. In our main method, we're going to create a new student named Stella. And now we're going to try to print Stella's ID number. Note that we're using dot notation here. Dot notation is when we take the object and we put a dot after it and we get the variable or function that we're trying to access. So here we're trying to get the ID number, so we use Stella.ID number. And what do we get here? One, two, three, four, five. Nice. We can also try to print out Stella.University. And this would print out UC Berkeley. 
Let's do another example. We have a new student, Stella, but now instead of printing out Stella's ID number, we're trying to print out the entire student class's ID number. And does the student class have an ID number? No, it belongs to an individual instance of a student. So this code is actually gonna error. Now let's try to print out the student's university, this entire student class's university. And this actually works because University is a static variable. It's for this entire class. Everything in the class has University UC Berkeley, so it'll print out UC Berkeley. Let's do another example with two students. We have Stella and we have Emma. We now change Emma.University to be UCLA. And remember, University is a static variable that represents the entire class. So now, when we go to print out Stella.University, we end up getting UCLA. Wow, that's because we changed the static variable. And when we change a static variable, it doesn't just change for one instance, it changes for all the instances. So if we change university for Emma, it changes for Stella, it changes for a student named Jake, a student named John, every student will now be changed. And that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in.